and welcome back to Meeting of the Minds. Today, I'm here with the great Dr. Michael Yassis. Dr. Yassis, thank you for joining us. Oh, my, my pleasure. I'm very excited to have you on. I have five of your books and been learning a lot of information. So I'm very intrigued about the Soviet sports training versus the American style of training. I have my master's degree in exercise science. And when I read your book, I didn't learn anything nearly as in depth as what the Soviets are doing. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I had the same reaction. Uh, they, they were, of course right now, there's no telling what's going on. But at the time of their uh, greatness, if I can put it that way, when they were doing very well in the Olympics and so on, uh, nobody came close to what they were doing in terms of research and training. The two were tied up. See, science and training were blended together. They didn't do anything by the seat of their pants. Everything had a reason for it. You did this because of this. This is what will enable you to do this and so on. Uh, yeah, they were so sophisticated and it, it's interesting. I couldn't get too many people to believe it. Oh no, they're not doing that. that that's just something that uh, they're doing to destroy our sports system in the United States. We don't even have a system. Everybody does his own thing. But they were very systematic. Yeah, it seems like in America, we have so much talent that we could kind of almost survival of the fittest. But for them, it seems like they're actually making, they're manufacturing athletes. That's right. Yeah, that's, you hit the, the nail on the head. See, we have uh, many, many athletes and many good athletes. You know, if you get a thousand athletes, you can't help but get one or two champions out of it or a hundred thousand. But the Soviets didn't have this. They didn't have the athletic base that we did. So they had to make athletes. And this is where science came in. In fact, it was, it was almost like an uh, edict, came, edict, edict that came down from the top. When we got beat and we knew the Americans were better than they were, uh, it was like, okay, this has got to stop. Um, Here's enough money. Do what you have to do. We got to beat them. And they developed this whole system from the kids right on up. And it was fantastic from their sports schools where they developed all these athletes to even the uh, regular, regular schools, how the sports and uh, physical fitness and physical education came into play. Yeah. Right. And, and then when did you discover this? And then when did you start diving deeply into, I know you learned Russian and you started reading their books. Um, no, it was right from the very beginning, okay. uh, probably in the 19, yeah, in the 1960s. That's when I started looking at their research, uh, reading and translating many articles. And I put them all into the, uh, at that time, the Soviet sports review, and then it, expanded and became the Fitness and Sports Review International. There were journals. I published these articles, training articles, uh, for many years. I stopped it in 1994 when the Soviet Union broke up. But prior to that, uh, many translations of great articles of things that they were doing, especially their research. In fact, I don't know if you're familiar with the Fitness and Sports Review, but uh, there are also quite a few articles that deal with wrestling, the psychological aspects, the uh, actual training aspects, and so on. I covered many different sports. You have those in English, especially the wrestling? Yeah, one. they're all in English. So there are, there are 19 years worth of four journals per year. So there are, there are, there's a total of 100 and and 16 issues. No, 1,016, what am I talking about? Yeah. Where would, where would I go to find that? Uh, just on our website. 
if you look on our website, uh, they're for sale, Fitness and Sports Review International. You get individual articles or buy a whole collective, uh, all of them at one time where there's a nice discount. Excellent. So can we can get, we can search for just wrestling, we're just soccer, we're just gymnastics? No, no, no. Uh, I didn't break it down that way. It, it, there's just too much information, or too many things. But but you can look through the table of contents. Ah. See, that's on, on the site. So you can pick out what you want or get them all. Oh, excellent. I think because when I was going through your book, Secrets of, of Russian Sports Training, it said something about psychological, something with wrestling. And I was wondering, where can I find that? Is that what you're referring to? That's in yep. that? Ah, that's okay. It. okay. I've been wondering that for years now. I'm glad I know. <laughs> <laughs> and now, one of the things I think I remember you saying in one of your books was that in America, we tend to invest heavily in gear, in the facilities, and the Soviets didn't do it like that. They invested heavily in athletic development, developing athletes. Was that in one of your books? Yeah. See, if you saw some of their training facilities, you'd say there's no way in the world they could develop an uh, Olympic champion. Like for example, the uh, weightlifting, where all the, uh, uh, the top weightlifters were. You walk in, big room, has, has barbells, uh, some with a pl pressure platform where they did some of their research. And uh, every once in a while, you gotta get a hammer and bang the nails in a wooden floor, keep it down. In fact, I remember a, a volleyball match. It was getting ready to start. They had to wait. And a few uh, guys came out with hammers and just went through the whole court and banged them down. See, very, you know, poor facilities, but great athletes. Right. So it's not the facility. It's what you do with the athletes. Right. It seems like in America, we're trying to look good. So it's get more gear, get new facilities instead of nutritionist, sports psychologist, strength coach, exercise physiology. Is that, do I have that right? Yeah. Uh, and they would get together, you know, like once a year uh, in, in that particular sport, all the people involved, they all get together and make a comp contribution. That's excellent. That's excellent. And one of the things, just kind of a random point, but I was as I was going through your um, Soviet sports training book, there was an apparatus that looks like a stall bar, but it also has a sliding bottom. So it's a slant board and you're also able to do things with your arms. What's the name of that? Is that for sale anywhere? <laughs> I know, I never made it, but uh, uh, that was just an apparatus to do different kinds of exercises. That one. All right, that's a plyometric sled. Really? Uh, yeah. It looks like the Chuck Norris Total Gym. <laughs> Go ahead. Say that again. Chuck Norris, the actor, he made it an exercise thing called the Total Gym. It looks like that because it slides up and down. <laughs> yeah, but see, uh, in, in that case, if, if I'm not mistaken, um, it slides into a resilient platform. Right. So as soon as it hits, you can push off again. Right, right. You know what that's called? Uh, had a name for it at one time. In fact, we developed an apparatus. What the heck did we call it? You really tapping my uh, memory here. Of course, this was back in the 80s, I think. Because it looks like there's so many things you could do with that. Oh, yeah. But it, it never took off. The sales were terrible, and it got disbanded after a while. Uh, yeah, it, it's a shame. There were more things like that that uh, we had to give up that we just couldn't get the sales. Right, right. And now one of the interesting things that you bring up in the book is the difference in the way the coaches are trained, the, the education they need to receive, um, kinesiology, physiology, whereas now it's basically like volunteer dads, which it, they, they're well-meaning, but they don't have nearly the same knowledge base. No, not even close. <laughs> uh, 
in fact, uh, well, let me just give you a little, I'll, I'll tell you how they're developed or how they're selected or trained. Uh, after high school, you had to apply to the sports uh, or the coaches co college. And if you had high enough grades and in addition, you were a high level athlete. See, like today we have physical education uh, departments all over. How many of them are great athletes? In fact, today, from what I've been able to gather, physical education is so broad and includes so many different fields uh, that the actual physical, physical education coach is a minor part of the physical education department. But in the Soviet Union, boy, you had to be a great athlete. You had to be a champion in that region. And, and you had to have the smarts. Then you were accepted. So in the uh, sports colleges, they did a lot of research and it was all with these high level athletes. So their research applied to high level athletes. It wasn't like doing research that applied to everybody like the way we do. Oh yeah, this physical education people should do this. Well, physical education people aren't athletes. They once were, in my day, <laughs> I was in physical education. Uh, you had to be a good athlete. But today, it's not important. Right. It would seem very important to have the practical know-how as well as the theory. Bring both of those together is a great combination. Right. And uh, also, it's interesting. See, I got to know quite a few of the Russian coaches. And when I visited a few times, this one coach who was a uh, high, no, pole vault coach, uh, he he came, we saw each other in the morning. He said, hey, congratulate me, Mike. I said, what for? He says, my boy just won uh, the competition in Moscow, so now I'm okay for the next five years. And I said, now, wait a minute. What do you mean your boy won in Moscow? You're here in, uh, uh, in Minsk. He said, well, what do you mean? He looked at me like I was nuts. He said, hey, he's a grown boy. He can take care of himself. Why do I have to be there? But yet you take a look at our mentality in the United States. Oh, the coach has got to be with him all the time. He's got to be holding the athlete's hand. Where I was there, <laughs> you were on your own, kid. We can train you. We can tell, give you everything. But then when you compete, you don't need us. Right. And this way, and me as a sports psychology guy, it doesn't give you that dependence on the coach. You have a level of self-sufficiency. Exactly. That's excellent. And talk about, I know you speak about it in this book a little bit. What, what did they do with, how did they approach the mindset and the sports psychology piece? I'm sure every sport was a little bit different, but what did they maybe have in common that they were doing that we're, we're not doing or we didn't do? Okay, they would use psychology not only in terms of determining what kind of an athlete he is. See, they identified four different types of uh, psychological, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Four different kinds of athletes. Okay. If you were this kind, uh, then this is the best training for you. If you were this kind, then you need more of this. So in other words, I identified the types of training to suit the particular personality of the athlete. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, and then in addition to that, they use the uh, psychological uh, in, in terms of some strategy. Like for example, uh, I remember once when I was with the Soviet uh, wrestling team and they had an athlete who would stick his left leg way out. Now, you know, when you, when you get into your, in your stance and uh, you're gonna begin uh, you know, at the beginning of every match. So he would stick his leg way out and nobody ever did this because boy, that's easy for the other one to grab it and take him down. But nobody ever could. 
See, he did it that way. It was so tempting. They would dive to get the leg, and then he'd be able to squish him down and, you know, get him in a position where he could handle him. So they used the psychology this way. See, what can we do to psych out the other guy to make him do a stupid move? Right. Right. So they're using it to enhance their athletes as well as playing mind games with their opponent. Right. That's that's interesting. And now what do you, do you ha have any documents? Is this on your site also that tells you how they grouped psychologically the different athletes? Yeah. I guess that'd be number one, what were the four categories? And then two, what is the protocol for training those different personalities? I don't remember all of them. So you, you're taxing my memory too much. <laughs> Uh, but one was the aggressive type, one was uh, uh, non-aggressive, um, one was sanguine. Uh, Sanguine? Yeah. And, and another one, I don't remember the four. So, yeah. But it was interesting to see how they would identify him and know which athlete is which. Did they have a lot of success with that? Like, do you think that would still be successful today if they did that? I don't see why it wouldn't be. Right. Makes sense. People are people. Human nature is human nature. That's right. Makes sense. And then, wow, yeah, that's, that's very interesting. I didn't know about that. And then the protocol to train those different personalities. Where would we find that? Uh... Well, I'm not sure. Maybe take a look. See, uh, you know, it, it's frustrating to hear you even ask questions like this because see, I had all of their journals, their coaching journals, and it was one in wrestling. But I was only able to translate maybe one-tenth of 1% 1 <laughs> of all the information available. See, so when you say, where can I find it? Yeah, it's all in the Russian journals, and I got them, you know, put away someplace. I wonder if there's people. I wonder if there's people in Russia who specialize in wrestling that would be able to. Boom! They have all of them. Uh, today, I have no idea. Yeah. At one time, yes, prior to the breakup. Right. But now, with the breakup and uh, Putin being uh, the screwball that he is, uh, it's hard to say. What's going on? How about this? What age would they assess the person's personality? Would it be once they got to be 11 or is it more like five, six, seven? No, no, no. They wouldn't do anything in these early ages. That's a misnomer that we we uh, perpetuated in the United States somehow. Yeah, but, talk about that a little uh, bit. Go ahead. They didn't do any serious research and investigation until they were much older when they became uh, legitimate athletes. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, they were, what? In their teens, someplace in their teens. And it depends upon the sport. If you're talking about gymnasts, then you're talking about much younger, especially with the girls. The men, a little older. So again, it takes a look at what age do you have to be to be great. See, everything was counted backwards. They, they would take a look at all the Olympic athletes. What ages are they? All right, so if you become great at age 21, now let's set up the timetable going backwards. At this age, you should be able to do this, then this, then this, until you become great. Oh, uh, okay. And I guess that, all, that information is all out there too somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, and I think it's easy, even in some of my articles. Which, which articles do you, I mean, any idea? I'm sure it's all. I, I remember doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I remember translating it, uh, but where it's living right now. Uh, I know you have in this, in this book, I know you have the age of their, when they should start specializing in a sport and you, right. also, and you also have, when's the average age of Olympic gold. Those, those are in this book. Oh, okay. Yeah. See, so there's, there's some of that information right there. Okay. And, and go ahead. Uh, and I just want to make a comment on when to begin specializing. See, today in the United States, we want to start specializing younger, younger and younger. 
mainly because of what Tiger Woods did. He Oh, he started hitting that golf ball when he was two years old or three years old, whatever. That's so stupid because, you know, not only are you not uh, uh, brain, developed in the brain to be able to function well, but even physically. So typically, most athletes in the Soviet Union didn't decide what they wanted to do or what they wanted to specialize in until they were 13 or 14 or 15. Not when they were very young. I guess the difficult thing there with in, in like, let's say, a sport like wrestling, generally speaking, because we have a different model than the Soviets do, we're thinking about become a state champion to get a scholarship for college, right? That we're thinking about getting to college, using wrestling to get into college. It would seem like you might need to specialize maybe a little bit younger if you wanted to achieve a good high level by the time you were 16, 17. It wouldn't make any difference. According to the Soviets, if you start at six or seven, what's the difference? See, uh, it only takes X number of years. Let's say, for example, uh, strength. No sense working on strength when you're too young. What you should be doing, and this is where the one by 20 program comes in. Yes. Give them the one by 20 program, the one by 20 strength training program. Uh, if you're very young, you're using very light weights, but you're learning how to do the exercise. And the more you do the exercise, the more you, the more you perfect how it's done. Then when you're old enough, when you're hitting puberty, then you begin developing strength. But you already can do the exercise. See, we, we don't give enough attention to how things are done. Uh, I have yet to see a book in the United States that really describes accurately how you do an exercise, or even in terms of technique, how something should be done. Um, I'm having some discussions right now on this lacrosse site. And I played lacrosse way back when. And they have this hang up on thoracic mobility. And I say, how can the thorax have any mobility? It's a rib cage, it's locked in. You know, you have this rib cage moves as a unit. No, it has mobility. <laughs> See, and you wonder, where did you learn this? You know, it, it's, it, it's so off the wall. It sounds like they might be, because I've heard that before, they're probably calling it the wrong thing. They're talking about like if, you're, if you could touch your arms, that kind of thing, the thoracic spine being open, but maybe they're using the wrong term for that. I don't uh, know. Whatever, yeah, see? <laughs> but you, then you bring up a good point. We don't define our words or what we mean. So we say all of these things, but we never define them. And in the Soviet Union, they were very good at defining the terms? Oh, yeah. We knew exactly what was, what was taking place. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So it, it, correct me if I'm wrong. You would start a young kid, whatever age they were, doing a variety of, you know, pull-ups, rope climb, gymnastics, body weight exercises. And then once they hit around age 10 or 11, you put them through the one by 20 program. Is that, is that about right? All right. Well, no, see before that, rather than the exercises, they would be doing various sports. At around what age okay. would they begin that? Oh, as soon as they can handle it. Okay. Like soccer, you could begin playing when you're, five years old, see, in the way we do here. Uh, but they didn't just go out and, <laughs> if you ever watch the game of youngsters, uh, let's say six years old, uh, that is five or six years old, you see a mass moving this way and, and moving that way. You don't see individualized, you know, play. Uh, so little by little, you know, we start separating the mass and we get some individual play. Uh, but the Soviets would, would not play. They would wait until the skills are learning. So what do they do? Uh, like in soccer, uh, you learn how to kick. 
and you learn how to pass. You learn the headshot. You learn this. You learn that. These are all the things you must learn. Then you can begin playing. See, like uh, in some of the sports schools, you didn't play until you were, it, it, well, it took a year or more of training in various elements before you started playing. See, we start playing first, then learn the skills. They learn the skills first, then play. It's backwards. Yeah. And we, and for us, we just see, oh, it's a great athlete. This one person can play really well and they might not have very basic fundamentals, right? And, like right. You, instead of developing the fundamentals. Yeah, like even we take a look, let's say football. Well, quarterback, and you, know, you take a look at Tom Brady and why not. He can be better. All athletes can be better. You can constantly be improving them. But see, we think once somebody makes the pros or, you know, they say gets into college or, or a little bit beyond, that they already are, are the greatest. You can't improve them anymore. Everybody can be improved, no matter what level. Right, right. What else should they do? Are there any exercises they should be doing at a young age, whether it's maybe gymnastics or pull-ups, just a general fitness or no? Uh, gymnastics was kind of universal. All the kids grew up with gymnastics, and right, rightfully so. Of course, gymnastics teaches you control of your body and you develop basic musculature. You can't hold yourself on a parallel bar if you don't have enough strength. Uh, you, you can't swing on a high bar until you have enough grip strength and ability to do these movements. So gymnastics was uh, uh, really very popular. And then at what age would you begin the one by 20? Actually explain what the one by 20 is. I have your book here. I'll hold it up. I'll tag everything inside the show notes, but one by 20, there it is. Yeah. Okay. It's a, system that, yeah. It's a system that I developed. Uh, well, a few coaches made me, <laughs> made me do it. Uh, I had this system that I uh, used all the time in training my athletes. Uh, and they said, well, give it a name. And that's how we came up with one by 20. In essence, uh, all right, first let me back up. A moderate intensity exercise creates greater adaptation in the body than a high intensity or low. The moderate intensity is the ideal intensity for learning and for development. Uh, but see, in the United States, high intensity is king. Come on, you got to max out. More, more, do more. Uh, we, we push them to the max, which is not very effective. So anyway, in my system, it was moderate, not moderate intensity. And you learned the exercises, very low weights. Uh, you had many repetitions and so on. So this became the system. You do many exercises, moderate intensity, which means that you're not using too much weight and you're doing high repetitions. You need the repetitions for learning. How many times do you have to kick a ball before you learn how to kick a ball? Thousands maybe. Well, we're not gonna be doing thousands, but uh, all right, so bottom line, you do an exercise, low intensity, high reps. The high reps are in up to 20 or more. Now that does not fatigue you, do an exercise, moderate intensity and, uh, and so on. So you can do more exercises. So I've, I found out that you can do 20 or more exercises for 20 or more repetitions in one training center sessions. Now this may seem like a lot and it is. So you, when you get done, you, you know you had one heck of a workout, but it's still moderate intensity. 
it doesn't fatigue you to the point where it takes you two or three days to recover. You're recovered by the next day. See, and the next day you can do more things related to the uh, technique. How do I throw? How do I jump? How do I uh, throw and so on? And then the next day we do it again. So here you are doing an exercise. Uh, let's say the first training session, you did it for 16 reps. Okay, next training session, maybe you did it for 17 or 18. Next training session, maybe you did it for 20. Then maybe you repeat it again on next training session. Then you got to 21, 22. Uh, then once you repeat the same workout, doing 22 or more reps, then you add more resistance. The greater resistance knocks you back down to about 15 or 16. Then you gradually work up again. And once you go over 20, drop down again or more weight. Okay. So it's very systematic and it's not overly taxing. This is the beauty of it. And we do exercises that are both specialized and general. The purpose of the program is to develop a foundation. You need a good foundation, a physical and technical, before you can become a great athlete. It's just like if you wanna build a house. Do you just start building the uh, second floor? No, you need a foundation. That's the very first thing you do. Then you build on that foundation. So the same thing in sports, we have to develop a foundation uh, and then uh, build on it. Excellent, what age would you start them on this program? Uh, typically, uh, any youngster should start training with let's say this program or uh, with the sport at about age eight, nine, ten. These are the uh, very formative years. They're the best years for learning technique, learning how to execute a skill. Doing it at six to seven, it's a waste of time. The kid who starts at eight or nine, he'll surpass that kid who started at six or seven. So that's why there's no need to start very early because when they are older in this, in this period of eight to, eight to 12, let's say, they will surpass anybody who started training before. And that doesn't just go for the exercises, but now you're speaking in skill in general. Yeah, okay. I'm talking about, let's say the technique, the skill, learning the skill. Okay. And developing the skills. And the same thing with exercises, you know, if, if you don't have the strength, what's the good of doing it? Right, right. So, okay, what would be an indicator of what weight to start with? Well, I guess there's exercise selection, how much rest in between you go from one exercise to the next? Let's start there. Okay, uh, the rest period is very short. Uh, once you feel ready, once you finish the 20, get okay. your breath, let's go on to the next one. Okay. See, so it'll vary be, you know, from different exercises. Uh, what I found most effective is to develop every joint in the body strengthen every joint in the body. So this means that you have like four exercises for the ankle joint, adduction, abduction, flexion, extension. You have two exercises for the knee. See, and, and I like to prefer uh, doing the exercise like I use my active cords. It's a, a set of uh, cords that I use that can do movements that you can't do with dumbbells and barbells. So for the uh, knee, we do like standing knee ex extensions and flexions. See, so it's more free range. You're standing and then you're extending and, and flexing, two different exercises. Then for the hip joint, we have at least four different exercises. Adduction, abduction, these, these again are with the active cords, learning how to develop the muscles on the sides of the hips. 
Then we do an exercise called the uh, uh, knee drive. These would be good for wrestlers too, by the way. Even though in the knee drive, we use that mainly for runners. In wrestling, in many movements, you got to whip that knee around to do whatever the move is. So that's why an exercise like this would be important. Then we have one called a paw back. This is where developing the ability to bring the leg back very forcefully. Uh, now we can throw in an exercise like the squat. But the squat is not that important initially. We can do that later. All right, and then uh, for the abdominals, at least three different exercises. Uh, the reverse trunk twist, reverse sit up, and 45 degree sit up. Uh, later on, uh, the exercise can become more advanced. From the reverse uh, trunk twist, we can go to the Russian twist. And I think you're probably familiar with the Russian twist. Okay, and then, uh, oh, and then for the lower back. And this is where I find most coaches are really lacking, not only in uh, giving these exercises, but knowing about them. And that's the back raise and back raise with a twist. Now, uh, we're not going into too much detail. Where the axis of rotation is, is critical to the development that you're going to get uh, from the exercise. For the back raise, the axis is in the waist. For hip extension, the axis is in the hips. Very little difference. But when you're hanging over, let's say the seat of a, a glued ham developer, if it's from the waist, you're getting one kind of development. If it's from the hips, you're getting another kind of development. So yes, where exercise ex execution becomes very handy or very important. All right, and then, so then we do the back raise and back raise with a twist. Why do we add these twisting actions? Because they're critical for full abdominal or lower back development. The erector spinae do not just you know, raise the trunk or do extension, but they're also involved in rotation. So for, you know, for, for wrestlers, it's critical that they do that rotational exercise in addition to uh, the straightforward one. So you can see how it moves up. Then we get into the shoulder, all the exercise for the shoulder, uh, then the elbow joint, wrist joint, and so on. Now the wrist joint is sort of interesting. Uh, most people don't do enough for the wrist. They do flexions and extensions, but they leave out ulna flexion and radial flexion and supination pronation. So all of these movements become critical at one time or another. All right, so anyway, uh, these are basically the exercises, and we can throw in some specialized exercises, you know, to make up the uh, full amount. And as they go along, sometimes the one by 20 can be repeated. Most often it is. Uh, there are athletes, you're gonna hear about this guy soon. His name is Quinn, uh, can't remember his last name right now. But he used only the one by 20 program and he became phenomenal. Uh, he's going to probably go on a second or third round in football. So just from using the one by 20, he became an outstanding athlete. And how many times a week should an athlete do that? Three times. Okay. Three times. An so, optimal number of exercises. What was that? 20 or 24 you said? Uh, yeah. And it could vary. There's no, uh, uh, there's nothing that says you can only do this on only that amount. It depends upon the athlete and what you're trying to develop. Typically at the beginning, we do more. But then as they get better, the second or third time that they're using this uh, routine, then we knock out some exercises that don't become important. Like for many athletes, ankle adduction and abduction are not important. 
So we drop that exercise. But we do it initially to get at least a base amount of strength in all of the joints. And we need this for injury prevention. When you get an injury, where does the injury occur? Typically to the weakest link or the weakest muscle. Right. Oh, that, make, that makes sense. And then how should we choose an initial weight to use? Like you say, moderate weight. Should it be a weight that we could do about 15 times? Right. See, and then you have to experiment. You, what, what weight can I use to give me uh, you know, five or six reps? See, that's why we start off with very, very low reps. Get a weight. All right, let me do five. See, that was light and easy. All right, next time, let's use a little bit more weight. See, and then you eventually get to the weight that you can handle for the X number of repetitions. And yeah, and work up until you hit 20. Once you hit 20, or once you hit more than 20, then you bump it up. Right. The weight, the weight. Yeah, wait, yeah. Okay. And then one thing that you spoke about there that I know is a big part of what you stress and the Soviet model about the importance of recovery. And a lot of times coaches are not thinking about that to the same extent that if you're wiping your body out with training, you only have so many hours a day and you only have so much energy. If you wipe yourself out in the weight room, you're not able to develop your skill, your craft. So you See, that's why this program is so, so ideal because you're not wiping yourself out <laughs> and you recover very quickly. So let's say if you're doing the exercises Monday, Wednesday, Friday, on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, you do the sports training. You work on technique or the te technical aspects and you're fresh enough to do it. Yep. Of course, you can't work on technique when you're tired. Right. You have to be fresh. Right. And then something I noticed in your book, uh, The Secrets of Russian Sports Training, was that the, the elaborate way that they recover, talking about exactly how to do a sauna, exactly how to massage different parts of your body, really broken out. And I mean, we used saunas and wrestlings more to cut weight, but not as a recovery. Right. And how in depth, what the, what the relative humidity should be, what the temperature range should be. A lot of things you spoke about that, that the Soviets did for recovery. Yeah, they, uh, in fact, I knew uh, uh, the person who was really the, the top guru, if I can use that term loosely, in the recovery area. Uh, he came from the massage world, but he knew about all the different methods and when they should be used and how they should be used, how they should be alternated. See, they did so much research on this. They didn't just come up and guess, all right, well, today we'll do the massage. Well, tomorrow we'll do this. Next, no, they did research to find out what is gonna be the most effective. So uh, that's really, uh, <laughs> shut up, that's phone. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and, and the nutrition too. Inside your book, it talks about the different vitamin requirements for each sport. And when you made that point, I said, wow, that makes so much sense. It's not just everyone gets X amount of vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin C. You have a hundred meter sprinter and you have a marathon runner who have two entirely different sets of needs. Yes. Uh, and this is, this is what I really liked about the uh, Soviet system. Nothing was left to chance. You know, it was all researched. What is the best way to do this? and the vitamins and minerals. See, like today, uh, I, I've, I've come to the conclusion that all athletes need some vitamins and minerals. Uh, and they should be whole food nutrition. Commercial uh, supplements do not work. Oh, you can take them, but they really don't help help you but when they're natural made out of whole food then they play a major role why is there such a big difference well let's put it this way nobody can duplicate what nature has done uh, they say oh yeah this, this is the uh 
we've analyzed it and we've come up with, you know, the formula. No, but they leave a lot of it out. There was no such thing in the artificial world, uh, let's say for vitamin uh, B. It's lacking. Vitamin C, you know what vitamin C is? Commercial. It's amniotic acid. So in other words, take a look at an egg. You have the uh, liquid, you have the yolk. The liquid is what is constituted as vitamin C in this country in, in the uh, uh, drug world. But vitamin C is a combination of the fluid and the yolk. And you get this in the natural supplement. Now, there are several co companies that produce only natural supplements. And I use these. One of the most popular that I use is Standard Process. So if you look up, uh, look them up online or Google them, you'll see how all of their uh, supplements are natural. Standard Process. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. And then a big, another big topic that I saw was the transfer of training. And this, mm -hmm. this makes a tremendous amount of sense. And almost no one really talks about this. Um, it seems like two things that really kind of cloud our judgment. There's bodybuilding and, and there's yoga. So when we think about getting stronger, we think bodybuilder. If we want to get more flexible, we think yoga. And it's my understanding of what you wrote. That's not a sophisticated way of looking at it at all. What you do in the weight room or stretching needs to transfer directly to your sports. We're so focused on hitting a max number that we're wasting time. That's right. All right. This concept of transfer is very big. Uh, Bundar Chuk was the one who uh, did a lot of research on this. He did his PhD in it. The, and he did oh, umpteen uh, different studies before the final dissertation. And he found that an exercise, in order to be transferred, the exercise has to duplicate the same neuromuscular pathway as seen in the actual execution of the skill. It has to develop strength in the same range of motion in which it is seen in execution of the skill. And it has, has to have the same type of muscular contraction as seen in execution of the skill. Uh, there are one or two others, but they're not as important, like the amplitude and, and so on. But these three I use to show the difference if that exercise does not duplicate the neuromuscular pathway, it will not transfer, period. So we have to look closely at how the exercise is done. Is it duplicating what we do in the sport? And then is strength developed in the same range? And is, does it have the same type of muscular contraction? These are the keys. Because even when I was in college, they would, tech, they would test your maximum, and this is a division one school ranked in the top 15 in the country. Max clean, max bench, max squat. And the idea is to get those numbers higher, not sophisticated. No, no, it's, it's, a, it's pure bodybuilding. Or powerlifting, right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we see this even to this day. Uh, and I'll share this with you. One of the bigger pro biggest problems I have uh, in training an athlete is the coach. I have an athlete, I put him on a one by 20. His coach wants him to do all of this high intensity. Two, two reps. That's the maximum you do. No more than two reps. What the hell is that going to do for you? <laughs> See, and, and, and 
So I have to tell them, look, when a coach is looking at you, smile and uh, like you're doing it or do it then. Once he walks away, stop doing it. You have to cheat. I hate to say this, you know, to an athlete, but learn how to cheat. It's a sad commentary. Right, because you're thinking about their recovery, their longevity to max it, to optimize the workout. You want to you want to make the exercise work for you. You don't want to work for the exercise. That's right. And then it sounds very similar with stretching. I work with a lot of wrestling teams and the coaches, what they'll do is they'll just have the kids do yoga. And I'm saying, I don't think that's what the kids need. That's not really training the stretches in the joint angles that they need to be strong in. I think about your book talking about active versus passive stretching for athletes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, about that a little. See, now the active stretching means that you have to move through that range of motion. You have to engage the muscles. See, and, and, and what I say, and this seems to stand up, don't even bother with flexibility training. I don't do any. But what I do do is have the athlete go through the full range of motion. When you go through the full range of motion, you have the maximum flexibility that you need. But if you're going to cheat, and let's say just do a, uh, <laughs> just went blank. Like a half. Let's say a biceps curl, half range. Well, sure. Then do exercises to fully extend the arm. And some stretches you want to be aware of. Uh, like I don't have any athlete do any standing toe touches because it's impossible to do, touch your toes without stretching the ligaments of the lower back. So, you know, if you can put your palm down or whole hand on the floor, you got a weak back. Really? Unless you're doing a heck of a lot of work on strengthening the muscles of the lower back. Uh, so full, when you said you, you'll have them do full range of motion, you're speaking about the traditional exercises like a squat and things like that? Yes, but the squat you gotta be careful of. Uh, there, I don't recommend full range of motion because when you go through the full range of motion, you're stretching the heck out of the knees. So you don't want that. So for most athletes, I can't think of a sport where they have to exert force when the knee is bent more than 45, 60 degrees. So most often we do quarter squats or half squats, never full squats. Doesn't do any good. And I think even in wrestling, many times you may get in a position like that, but when you go into a full knee bend or when your knee is bent fully, you can't exert much force. You gotta straighten that leg a little bit and then you got force. Most of your force is at the tail end uh, when you're straightening the leg fully. So you would break 90 degrees that you, wait, yes, you'd break, not, you'd go deeper than 90 degrees, but- well, Okay, let's, let's define 90 degrees. Yeah. Is that 90 degrees in the knee joint? Yes. Well, then you're never gonna get to the thigh level position. Right. So you need you know, to go- 90 degrees, you know, it, it's more like a quarter squat. Oh, okay. I guess, yeah, what am I thinking about then? I, I just think about how, how they say you have to be parallel. Everyone says for, I call 90 degrees parallel with the ground. Yeah, but it isn't 90 degrees. It's more than 90 degrees. It's more like 135. Okay. Okay. So, so See, and, and what's the purpose of going to thigh level? See, how many movements, uh, let's say do the, uh, maybe wrestling could be a little different. But does an athlete, a typical athlete, do that involve greater flexion in the knee? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, if you're doing plyometrics, uh, you don't have a full 90, 90 degrees, much less. Right. When you're exerting force, uh, even in wrestling, 
uh, I don't think it's really needed because if you're using the legs to straighten or push somebody away, uh, it's near the tail end that you have the force. That's true. I guess not, I, not I, when you have a full knee bend. Yeah, that's true. Even when you're lifting, even when you're lifting the person up, you're you're really close to the top there still too. Yeah. Okay. And then the, so with and with stretching, you would say more active forms of stretching, just moving through a full range of motion. Right. Except the squat, you would say. Yeah, because you don't want to go deep. Okay. See, and then it's like saying, well, full range of motion in which joint? <laughs> in the hip joint or in the knee joint or in the ankle joint? Right, right. Yeah, unfortunately, coaches are just applying the power lifting or bodybuilding or just yoga. And I think it's just for simplicity's sake. Like instead of actually knowing the science, yeah, just go to that yoga club and they'll get you and they'll take care of your flexibility. Go to that body, that personal trainer, they'll get you strong and they try to throw it all together as opposed to being more systematic with it. Okay, now let me let me bring in something here. Uh, these are what we call general exercises. General exercises are good at the beginning, uh, but why go to a different sport like yoga? Why do you need yoga to get the flexibility? It should be flexibility with the wrestling moves. Look at what you're doing there. Uh, why go to why go to any other sport? You have to do it in your sport. Right. It has to apply to what you do in your sport. Right. But just getting general general flexibility, what do you need it for? It's going to make you more prone to injury. People never talk about that. That's never brought up at all. But this is what it does. You want um, joints that are not too flexible. You want more tightness. Now, see, this could be misconstrued. So um, I, I, I hate to use the, this terminology sometimes. Uh, if I took a world-class wrestler, <clears throat> especially some of the, the Russian ones. And I asked them to touch the floor with, with their, their hands or come close to it. They wouldn't be able to do it. Or some other movies. No. They, when they're tighter, you're able to exhibit more strength. You're able to counteract quicker and better. But if you have a great deal of flexibility, let's say your opponent grabs you, and then he's going to twist you into a pretzel. I've you don't want that, that. I've seen that before. Wrestlers who are too flexible, their opponent can tie them up in ways you couldn't take someone. You couldn't take the other guy's arm that way because their arm doesn't go further than that. Right. See, so when you stop to think about it, <laughs> you can see how many of the things that we practice have no substantiation. Uh, we, we have no basis for it. Makes and sense. very often we just don't look and examine what we're doing. Right. And I guess bringing it full circle, that's what the Soviets did a great job of. Yeah. That's excellent. They did. Excellent. Dr. Yes, thank you very much. This has been tremendously helpful. Where can we send people First of all, is there anything I missed? Anything that you were going to say that maybe I cut you off? <laughs> no, I, I can keep going on, but uh, I, I think we kind of covered the waterfront. Excellent. excellent, excellent. Where can I send people to find more information about what you do? And then if people were interested in being coached by you or people in your organization, where can we send them? Yeah, I have programs uh, and it's all on my website. And the website is Dr. Yeses at dryesses.com. That's D-R-Y-E-S-S-I-S at D-O-C-T-O-R, yeses.com. And the website is just Dr. Yeses spelled out, dot com. Oh, 
yeah, I gave you my email address. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, but the website is dryesis.com. Dryesis.com. And I'll make sure I'll put it in the show notes. There won't be any confusion with that. Yeah. Excellent. And it's just D O C T O R, yeses.com. Excellent. I'll throw it in there. And then you said those journals that you said you that's that's on the same website? Right. Excellent. Uh, yeah, you just look on the books. Excellent. Excellent. And you'll see them there. And Excellent. then I have quite a few books that uh, you don't have that can also very be, be very good. Like, for example, Build a Better Athlete. Better That's athlete. a great book that uh, many coaches tell me this is what helped them. There you go. You got it. Yeah. yeah. Any books in particular for a wrestler? Uh, not really. Uh, there are little bits here and there in the other place. Right. Oh, I'm finding a lot of great information that's good for wrestlers scattered throughout the book. I was just thinking if you had anything all consolidated. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I wish I did. You know, I, I wish I had this in all sports, but you know, there is so many and so much information and trying to narrow it down. It gets kind of tough. That's right. Well, thank you very much for all that you've done to bring all this information to the forefront. I hope I can pass this out with all the athletes that we work with. So thank you very much again, Dr. Yeses. You're very welcome. All right. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye.